Hello, my name is Mikhail Kolmogorov. I am currently a postdoc at UC San Diego. And in this talk, I am excited to present um, our most recent research on algorithms for long read assembly using repeat graphs. And in particular, I will cover uh, our assemblers called Fly and Metafly. And uh, of course, I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. So first of all, I will give a brief introduction to genome assembly. And as you probably know, our goal is to reconstruct the genome sequence given the sequencing reads. And what you are typically looking for is uh, reads that are sharing overlaps. This is suggesting that they are coming from the related region of the genome. And this means we can try to uh, stitch them together similar to assembling a big puzzle. And as you probably know, uh, assemblies of relatively large genomes, large and complex, are typically not complete, so they're fragmented. And the reason is repeats in the genome. So in this example, we have uh, three repeats shown in red and reads that are shorter than repeats are coming as sample from this genomic regions, and they're actually indistinguishable for us. And that means we cannot assemble through. So we can assemble the sequence in between repeats, and uh, the sequences are called contexts. But what we really want is long reads that span over the repeat sequences and allows us to generate a complete genome. And this is why everyone was uh, so excited about new long read sequencing technologies. And as you probably know, the assemblies of different organisms, not including human, uh, have improved dramatically. So the technology was really driving the new genomic discoveries, but was it only the technology? Of course not. There were a tremendous number of algorithms that have been developed in the past uh, few years to support the uh, the analysis of long sequencing data and the assembly of long sequencing data. If without that improvements, uh, it wouldn't be possible to um, to get to these achievements that we uh, recently had. And if you're not convinced about the importance of algorithms, I will just give you a single example. Uh, this is a human genome assembly from uh, ONT reads, and uh, this data set uh, was generated. Uh, in the first um, study that used ultra-long sequencing protocol. And on this plot, different colors correspond to different contexts. And if you see the change in color, it means that the assembly is fragmented with this position. So looks good. And when we developed FLY, uh, sometime after the uh, this story was published, we improved the assembly of the same data set just using a different method. And year after, the assembly improved even further with the newer version of uh, Fly. But if, if you think that this assembly is cool, take a look on our most recent assembly of the same data set. So as you can see, using the same data as input, but improving the algorithms, we can uh, basically triple the contiguity of the uh, assembled genome. Uh, have you reached the full potential of the data? I don't think so. And I actually expect more improvements to come in the near future. Um, so now I will introduce you to assembly graphs, which are common data structures that are used in genome assembly. And well, assembly graphs are really very convenient way to represent the sequencing data. And uh, all different kinds of assembly algorithms build different graphs. So the, um, they could be very different kinds of graphs, like overlap graphs, or string graphs, or different graphs. And um, they have a little bit different properties. In this talk, I will introduce you to one of the methods called different graph. And here's how we can construct such graphs. So first of all, I will explain how to construct a graph from a complete genome. And then I will explain how to use this for uh, the genome assembly problem. 
So in this graph, we'll consider the substring of length k in the genome that are called k-mers. And in this example, k equals 3. For each uh, k-mer in the genome, we will put a node on the graph. So a, a, g correspond to uh, this node. And the next k-mer, a, g, a correspond to node, a, g, a. And we put an edge between nodes if the corresponding k-mers are adjacent in the genome. But what happens if the k-mers are sampled from the repetitive part? Well, they will actually correspond to the same node, such as in this, in this example, j, c. Uh, all instances of JC are collapsed. And because uh, there is basically spell the same thing. And this means that uh, the Bruin graphs collapse, repeats on path, uh, into the same paths. So we can build this graph on the genome. But in case of genome assembly, we have our reads. In fact, we can apply the same algorithm to build a different graph from reads. And if you're careful, then the resulting graph will be exactly the same as it had been constructed from a complete genome. Can we apply this paradigm to log reads? Well, let's take a look. So Illumina reads uh, are rather short. So hundred or a couple hundred nucleotides long, but they're very accurate. On the other hand, in case of long reads, we have uh, we can have reads over uh, ten or even th hundreds of thousands, but the error is by at least a single order of magnitude higher. And this means that the deep Bruin graph approach will fail, because deep Bruin graph relies on the exact matches between the reads, but since there are so many errors. The graph, the Bruin graph constructed from long reads will have uh, a lot of tangles like you can see in this picture and it's just impossible to analyze. So to overcome this uh, in our fly assembler, we have proposed to use repeat graphs instead of the Bruin graphs. And you can view repeat graphs really as a generalization of the Bruin graphs. So the idea is, remains the same. So we want some kind of graphs that will collapse repeats into the same paths and reveal these genomic repeats. But we want these graphs to uh, tolerate errors in long reads. So we want approximate matches instead of exact matches. Here's the algorithm, how can we construct such repeat graph? So imagine this, uh, this is our genome. So this genome has uh, repeat A and repeat B. And what we will do, we will perform a local alignment of the genome against self. And the alignment could be visualized on this plot. So the first alignment is trivial. So the genome aligns to itself. Uh, here's another alignment. So this is the first copy of B aligned to the third copy of B. And the alignment is represented as a, a, a diagonal on this plot. So here's the alignment of uh, instances A, B, or the first instance of A, B to the second instance of A, B. And here's the final alignment of the uh, second copy of B to the third copy of B. Uh, so far, this is a pairwise representation of repeats in the genome. So now we want to convert into a graph one. So we need some nodes and our nodes will be the endpoints of the alignments. So, and for each alignment endpoint, we'll project it on the main diagonal and we'll go ahead and do this for uh, all other alignment endpoints. And an important part is if the projections are close on the main diagonal, we will cluster them together into a single node. And the color, they will share the same color and the color will also be propagated, as you can see in this example with uh, blue nodes. And we go ahead and continue this for all alignment endpoints. Now, if you traverse the main diagonal, we already have some kind of graph. So we have nodes and we have sequences between these nodes. And next step is to glue the nodes that share the same color, like shown in this plot. And finally, we glue the parallel edges 
that spell the same sequence, like A and B in this case. And this is our final repeat graph. So as you can see, it reveals the repeat structure. It reveals the repeated units A and B and shows that A is repeated twice and B is repeated three times. So now we can construct this graph from a complete genome, but how do we apply it for genome assembly? Well, let's think about it. So let's assume that this is a perfect repeat graph built from a complete genome as it had been available. So of course we don't know this graph, but interestingly we can um, think about, we know that the genome traverses this graph somehow, is a certain path. And that means that reads, which are also parts of the genome, they also correspond to paths on this graph. And using this observation, we can actually walk on this graph without even knowing its structure. So we take a single read, and we take any other read that shares a sufficient overlap with the current read and extend our walk. And we go ahead and continue until we hit the sequence that already had been assembled. This results in something that we call a disjointed, which is essentially a random walk on the repeat graph. So this walk doesn't necessarily correspond to repeat genome, to the, uh, to the genome, but you can generate this disjointed really, really fast because we do not care about just all repeats at this point. But once we have the complete set of disjointics, we can apply the repeat graph construction algorithm and it will build a repeat graph as it had been constructed from the completed genome. And intuitively, this is because all the possible misassemblies that we have made during our random walks, they correspond to long repeats on the graph, but these repeats will be collapsed once we uh, glue our graph together. So after we constructed the graph, we will need to simplify it to generate the final sequence. So, and here's an example how. So let's assume we have this genome with a single repeat and we have the corresponding repeat graph. Uh, we don't know how the genome traverses it. So it could be like this or like that. But uh, once we have our long reads, we can map them on the graph and which will allow us to simplify it and generate the final sequence. And here's an example of a real uh, graph simplification. This is a repeat graph of a bacterial genome and uh, repeats are shown in colored edges. And this is how the graph looks after repeat resolution using uh, long reads. So you can see it became much, much simpler and the remaining repeats were uh, rather long, so there were no reads that cover these repeats in full within the data set. And the final graph is used to generate the uh, context. So here's the overview of the uh, complete pipeline. So we have our reads that come from the genome. We generate these joint ticks, which also could be viewed as condensed representations of all reads. We generate the complete set. We perform local alignments of these disjointics against themselves and use this alignment as gluing structure instructions to build the graph. And once the graph is built, we align reads and resolve repeats and then generate the final assembly. So this is the algorithm. And now I will show you how uh, can we apply it to generate human assemblies. Uh, just again, to put this into perspective, here how uh, short read assemblies look like in the past. So they're very, very fragmented as you can see. And this is what we can uh, generate using fly from the uh, Oxford nanopore reads. And of course, if you can generate even longer reads or reads with uh, higher coverage, the assembly will become even better. So this is a fly assembly of the uh, ultra long set of Oxford nanopores that have been generated by the telomere to telomere consortium. But of course, ultimately we want to get here. At some point, we want to get a complete uh, assemblies of both haplotypes. So here's another recent example. So in this case, we are assembling 
Oxford Nanopore reads generated by a human functional reference consortium for the uh, HD002 uh, cell line. And in this case, we wanted to get the uh, haplotype resolved assemblies. And to do that, we beamed on T reads using the uh, eternal kamers uh, with a trio canoe approach. And then we assembled it using fly and then applied Midaka to polish the assembly. So, and we got paternal and maternal haplotics within the range uh, 38 and 45 megabases, which looks good. Uh, but we also care about the uh, base quality. So, and here's some, some evaluations that we have done. So um, initially we assembled the reads that were base called using GAPI 3.2. And before applying Midaka, we got the uh, QV values around 28 and 29, and this QV values me uh, measured using Mercury uh, based on K-mer frequencies. And after applying Midaka, um, as you can see, QV improves substantially. So, which is very, very useful. But if you use a more recent base color using on the same data, you can get even better quality. So using uh, the reads base code with GAPI 3.6, we reached QV uh, 34 before applying Medaka and 38 after applying Medaka. But we also fortunate to uh, use more recent uh, data sets generated from the same cell line using uh, the newest R10, R10.3 uh, R10 nanopore. And, um, this uh, pore uh, pushes QV even to even higher values. So after Midaka, we achieved uh, QV 40 and uh, 42 for, for two haplotypes. So this is really, really, really exciting, but this is, does not include the most recent developments uh, and most recent versions of GAPI. And we expect uh, the QV values to become even better. And here's just the illustration of the uh, phase inaccuracy which we expect to be nearly perfect because we're using trio beaming. But ultimately, uh, we want to do this uh, without paternal information. And uh, in my opinion, the, imp uh, the recent improvement in row read based quality uh, should facilitate that. And finally, I will present uh, some results on the metagenome assembly. So the problem of metagenome assembly might look uh, simpler, but in fact, it's more difficult than uh, because we essentially assembling many genomes simultaneously and the species composition might be highly uneven and there could be repeats that are shared by the different genomes. Short read metagenomic assemblies were typically highly fragmented and this is how they might look like. But using long reads, we can generate much better metagenomics assembly. So this is a mock bacterial community assembly from deep ultra, uh, deep uh, oxid nanopore sequencing. And as you can see, many bacteria are already complete. Uh, and there are two bacteria that are sharing one long unresolved repeat. So this looks really good. And we try to apply it on real meta, for real metagenome assembly. And this is the graphs that we got. So dramatic difference and this look uh, this graph become very, very tangled, as you can see, and it's really, uh, it's really hard to understand what's going on. But if you zoom in, you can get a hint. So you can see this linearized genome structure, but there are some disruptions on the path that correspond to bubbles, or maybe even more complex tangles. And what we think is happening is that we expect bacterial chromosomes to look like this, but in more realistic case, in case of real metagenomes, there might be a lot of heterogeneity, uh, such as in this example uh, of a bacteria that we recovered from a sheep fecal sample using Metafly. And in Metafly, we really focused on discovering all those heterogeneities and assembling through them. So uh, we improved, uh, we, we added a lot of craft methods to account for that. And we, uh, we benchmarked uh, Metafly on simulated data. So we generated simulated data for 180 bacteria. And as you can see, some bacteria were assembled well by all methods, 
but there is a substantial number of genomes that were assembled by Metafly better. And those are mostly complicated bacterial genomes with either low uh, coverage depth or uh, bacteria that have close related strains or species present in the mix. And the same trend uh, with the NGA50, so with the contiguity, uh, there is a range of bacteria which were substantially better assembled using Metafly. And of course, we tried to apply it for the real metagenomes. And uh, this is an example of a metagenomic sequencing using LNT uh, of a cow Ryman metagenome. And um, as you can see on the graph, you can see some circular elements corresponding to the complete bacteria. And we also see a lot of uh, presumably heterogeneity. And we indeed discovered a lot of bubbles and super bubbles, such as in this example. So we have a circular bacterial genome, but we also have a lot of bubbles here. And uh, seven contexts uh, that were assembled were actually over 90% complete as measured by check M. So representing here the complete bacterial genomes. And this is very exciting. So from a single uh, sequencing run, you can get a lot of complete and nearly complete bacteria that probably have high degree of novelty because they live in such complex environments. And another interesting result is we were able to recover uh, biosynthetic, complete biosynthetic gene clusters for metagenomic assemblies. And these gene clusters, uh, some of these gene clusters encode important natural products such as natural produced antibiotics. And this cluster can rarely be possible to uh, reconstruct using short trees. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank all these people who contributed to the development of FLY and Metafly and also to analysis of the results. And I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you.